Welcome back to iHeartRadio. So bad it's good. Today, listen, I feel like I just saw this person two weeks ago at BravoCon. And it turns out, I think it's like six months since BravoCon or something insane like that. Um, and I had the best time meeting her. I mean, she is in a class by herself. If you are looking to have the law explained to you, it's this beautiful intersection of pop culture and the law. And it's from somebody that has over 17 years of experience as a lawyer and a former LA deputy district attorney, but also she is a juggernaut. She is what you call a quadruple threat. I mean, a lawyer, a YouTuber, a podcaster, a TV correspondent, and the list continues to go on and on and on. I didn't, she was one of the first people that my friend turned me on to that I didn't realize people were watching watching YouTube as TV like they're just having YouTube on their TVs I didn't even I didn't even know you could do that I was like why are you watching YouTube on TV and she's like I watch hours of it and the, I would watch the her on the Johnny Depp trial and anyways let's just get into this because I have so many things to uh talk to her about the legendary Emily D Baker thank you so much for being back on so bad it's good I'm so glad to be here. That was such a kind introduction. I always love getting to chat. I had the most fun with you at BravoCon. I can't believe it was so long ago because it does feel like it was weeks ago, but I'm also really antsy to do it again. Like I'm ready for BravoCon to be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I because I I put that thing up where you commented on it could p potentially be in Vegas, and I was like, well, why not? Let's just do it in May. And by the way, now I'm ready. By the, well, this is how this is how not Q and this is how conspiracy I've gotten where you left a comment, Emily, on it of like that may be true, and I was like, is she saying it's May? Is she saying she knows it's May? Is she? I was like, what is it May? And you were just saying that may be true. Like it's gonna be May. No, I'm ready. <laughs> I imagine they're gonna still do it in the fall, though. But wouldn't now be the perfect time to capitalize on all the interest focused at, at Bravo because of everything going on with VPR? I exactly, and in fact, I think they should take it a step further. I've said this is that when they do this, they need to build a courtroom set. Let you be a prosecutor there and do Bravo Court. I've told that, you know, like you get all the, and then we actually the litigate. I want to be the judge of Bravo Court. Can I be the judge of Bravo <laughs> well, Court? Yes. We can pull in lawyers. We can, we can litigate these issues. I want to be we, the judge. <laughs> we, and we litigate all of these famous Bravo cases that are going on. Um, And before, I guess we'll, we'll hop into this. I just wanted to share what I've shared with the audience before. When I met you at BravoCon at the top floor of the Ga Gansvort at this uh, Friday night Bravo party, you grabbed me and said, you got to come see this. And you took me over to watch Jen Shaw dance. Yeah. And I was like, what is going on? Like, it was, was she so was like, surprised she was uh, there. And having the time of her life. Yeah, living it up. I was surprised. Um, and it wasn't just watching Jen dance. For me, it was watching everyone else reacting to the fact that she was there, which is what I thought you would enjoy too. I was like, you have to oh, see this. Dude, it, it was, was a circus. Watching. It was a whole scene. Like there were there, it's like one of those seek and finds where there's like people talking in the corner. It's like, where's Waldo? And there's all these little things going on in a scene. If you had taken a picture of that moment, it was Jen dancing, some people leaving the room, some people watching, everybody processing that she's there. Cause people at that point, some knew that she was there, some didn't. She had been in other people's hotel rooms earlier that day, but not all that information <laughs> had come out yet. It was it was a wild night. We have a well, lot. I'll start there, though, is that Jen now is in a, a, you know, a correctional facility in Texas, I believe. And is it true that just last week uh, her lawyers uh, filed to uh, remove themselves from her case? Is, is there truth to that? I, I have been very, very knee deep in the uh, in the Gwyneth Paltrow coverage. I have not seen it, but <laughs> here I have not gone through the docket. <laughs> Here's why I wouldn't be surprised if they're not appealing because she pled. There's really not much else that they need to do. So yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if she had someone else to communicate with. There's not much left to do in her case. So even if that is the case, um, which I have no reason to doubt that it's not, it wouldn't be really a big deal. But normally you keep correspondence with the attorneys. Maybe Jen has another attorney coming in for post-conviction correspondence who doesn't cost quite as much as trial counsel. Trial counsel can be quite a big expense. And this is a high profile attorney. So she might have another attorney coming on for her post-sentencing needs. And that wouldn't be scandalous or strange in any way. Yeah, no, it 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 really uh it really boggles my mind and it's a perfect example of Bravo really taking over the law community and we 
have this going on continuing today where Sheena Shea uh, had uh, Raquel Rachel Levis had filed a temporary restraining order or a, and then they had to do a hearing that was this morning and the TRO was dismissed, right? Could you walk us through what happened here? This isn't uncommon. And this is what I said from the second I saw this being filed is don't expect this to go to hearing for March 29th. It's set to go to hearing, but oftentimes these hearings don't happen and the entire thing just gets dropped. The point of a temporary restraining order is that they're easy to get and they let emotions cool. They let a situation cool down and the court just evaluates them on what's submitted as if it's all true. The judge isn't weighing the truth of the circumstance. The judge is going, if you say this happened and this happened, you've signed it under oath. If this is the entire facts, then yes, we're going to grant this temporary restraining order. We will litigate it later to determine if a more permanent solution is necessary. I thought this was always going to get dropped at some point. It was interesting to me that it initially there was a 500 yard stay away and then that was changed to a hundred yard stay away. Initially it was a no harassment order, not a no harassment and no contact. And the court then signed the no contact, meaning no conversation through third parties or elsewhere, which would have big implications to a reunion, right? Because yeah, I would think so. Third party contact. If Andy Cohen saying, well, Sheena said this, and now you're saying this, but it seemed they all showed up, didn't they? They all showed up. I mean, I, I did know that they had kept them outside of the, like, you know, they had two separate seating yards. charts, yeah. you know, hundred yard distance. They weren't, you know, they took Sheena out of the building. They took, you know, and they didn't, I believe they didn't even have her on zoom because that would have been contact um, in, in that sense. So yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about all of this, but uh, everybody was fighting me on this when I initially had posted the TRO was going to have an effect on the reunion. And people said, no, because it's not granted yet. No, but in California, they just say, hey, no contact they, until we have a hearing. They rubber stamp them. Yeah, they yeah. very, very easy to get. And anyone who watched the Johnny Depp case knows this because the beginning of the Johnny Depp case really started with that 2016 TRO where Amber Heard was photographed coming out of the courthouse. And some were like, he must have done this with this TRO. Not necessarily. The TRO is one version of events. People perceive things differently and they are very easy to get. The The purpose of this in courts is to allow emotions to cool in heated situations where people feel like they may be in danger. It allows people to change locks, remove a party from a home. It allows them to remove somebody that's harassing them at the workplace. It's supposed to allow tempers to cool so people don't get harmed. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, there are restraining orders and harm still happens. That is never what we thought was going to happen in this VPR. It was really seemed to be to A, let emotions cool, and B, to maybe encourage the cast to not talk shit on social media. That was my first thought. I was like- Well, that didn't, it didn't work. Sorry, state of California, it didn't work. Yeah. The talking shit didn't, have, well, Sheena didn't though. Sheena didn't say anything No, Sheena went through, well, Sheena it. went through, had everybody else do that for her, which I thought we were going to do regardless. But then we see her today have her big, legally blonde, my cousin Vinny moment. Well, you know, I saw, you know, she's walking in with Brock, her her husband. She's well-dressed. She's, you know, and by, by the way, there's a camera crew there. So I, I assume we will be seeing a little bit of this in of the course. finale. Yeah, of, of course. course. Well. And I was like, uh, at uh, Kiki, the talk of shame, she was like, do you want to go to this? And I was originally, but then I heard it was just going to be an open and shut kind of a thing. But now I'm like, I would have loved to have seen that walk in because she was like very defiant. She was like, this is my day in court. Is this an abuse of the court system, Emily? I, I'm always hesitant to say that filing a TRO if somebody feels in danger is an abuse of the court system. I don't know what Rachel or Raquel or what have you was feeling. I, I have to admit to you, and I've admitted this on the internet. I don't say watched, it, Emily. Don't never, say it. I had never watched VPR. Um, oh, my God. I am now in season <laughs> five. I think um, <laughs> Tina just announced that she's getting divorced and Jim <laughs> is dating Raquel. That's well, where I'm at in VPR. So it's okay. like Spo spoiler alert, Emily. Sheena's <laughs> Sheena's married again, and DJ James Kennedy is not with Raquel Rachel. Spoilers. And her name's Rachel. Spoilers. But I am now getting very caught up. And I'm, <laughs> oh, this is so interesting going into it. I'm excited. But no, I don't think if somebody feels unsafe, they should be able to use the court for that. Can that process be abused? Yes. Can it also be colored by somebody's perspective? Yes. Could this seem strategic knowing that the reunion was coming up? 
also, yes. But that's she, what I was wondering too. Yeah. Was this a strategy? Because everybody was saying Possibly. that. I mean, you know, but listen, I think it backfired, you know, don't you? I definitely think it did, but there's always going to be that 20% that will still believe whoever, you know, it's like people still believe OJ. So not, not that this is the same thing, but people will always believe if you say something and never say that it's a lie, people, there will be a, a, a group of people that will still believe you. I, I've noticed it seems and like in pop culture. Ryan, if you tell me that reality show castmates go to hands, like hands on with each other, I'm not going to be shocked. We've seen exactly it, not just on this show, we've seen it, but we've seen it across reality shows that when alcohol and emotions are involved, people will smack each other, punch each other. They will get a hair pull. And we've seen this across franchises on Bravo, less now than we did in the past, but we will see this. So am I surprised that there was a picture of Raquel with a, a cut to a her Scott, eye? Yeah. No, I'm well, not. But the, How that happened, and, who knows? And that's the thing too, is that, you know, I'm, I'm in agreement with everybody. Everybody will always be like, violence is never the answer. I'm like, you're right, but you have to think. But I'm not surprised. Alpha but if alcohol and these things about betrayal and these large emotions and large betrayals get involved, that you do run the risk of uh, like my mom always told, like I always say, my mom said, never, if somebody cuts you off, never flip them off or anything like that. Cause you don't know if they have a gun in the car and they're going to come get you. Like you do live always, in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's just always like, and I've always remembered that. Like, don't be angry. Cause you never know what's coming back at you. Right. Um, so the, uh, the Mr. Rahami, I believe, is uh, Sheena's lawyer, and he released a very uh, intense statement today after the court uh, saying, of course, R Rachel didn't show up. We knew she wouldn't because it was a false case from the beginning. And Sheena, you know, Sheena knew from the very beginning that she did not hit her. But we finally get the admission that she did shove her after Rachel grabbed her wrist. So now we're getting the details filled in a little bit more. Then Raquel, Rachel's attorney, said, well, at least we're finally admitting this happened at all. Um, and Sheena did put like, now it's still going back and forth. And I'm like, this is where, I don't know if we check out cause we're not going to relitigate this. And I don't think they are going to relitigate this. It's not going to come back up in court. And again, with a TRO, it's only one side of the story. And I know early on, Sheena's attorney had said, we'll have our moment in court, but now that it's dropped, Sheena can talk about it. So I wouldn't be surprised if they have a post reunion, sit down with her and talk to her about it, which ultimately is good for Bravo. The person who wins in all of this is Bravo. NBC Bravo, Universal Bravo, is, Bravo. yes. Yeah, I mean, like, just film the season 11 right now. Do not take a break. Like, everything is happening right now. Now, this we is like- do that with Salt Lake City, too, where they picked up cameras very yes. quickly if things were happening. We know that they do this. So yeah, just I mean, rolling. Well, I mean, they were quick enough to, like, once the cheating was discovered on Wednesday night, they had cameras rolling by Friday morning. Like, that's, and I, I, I really hats off to the production company that was, like, s s smart enough, because they did, they knew this would play, but I don't think they knew it was going to be the, like, cultural zeitgeist that it turned into the last month. Right. Um, and we're on the tail end of that, hopefully, uh, even though we have all the episodes to see. Now, this is just a warm-up, though, because we currently, and you currently, I mean, you're in war right now, because we are in the trial of the century, Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> is mowing down people on ski resorts. She has a vendetta against <laughs> skiers and older men. And there is, it's the most, it, you think the Murdoch trial was bad, Emily. I mean, this must just be, do you hug your family at night after covering the Gwyneth Paltrow trial? After I cry. Yeah, after I got my family, and then I take a I, I take a very long, hot bath and try to catch up on Vanderpump Rules. This is how I want to get uh, Most of that is true, but this is a very interesting case that these types of cases go to court all the time, and you never see them because they're so specific just to the parties involved, and those parties are often not celebrities. So the fact that we have Gwyneth Paltrow sitting in court every day with her green juice or whatever, her like looks, homes in there with her green drink. Oh, the trial look, the trial fashion has changed substantially. We went from kind of chunky sweaters to like very sleek court apparel very quickly. Like the shift was so noticeable <laughs> in court from the first two days to after. It's been interesting. This trial. What's day six, right? Or day day six day or day seven. seven? Day seven is we're recording this. The trial will end on March 30th. This judge has said that he is going to be very strict on time. We okay. have now seen Paltrow's legal team sprinting to get in the rest of their witnesses. They were reading in testimony of Paltrow's kids because they just need to get this trial done. Closing arguments will be Thursday the 30th, and then I think we'll have a pretty quick jury verdict um, either later on Thursday or on Friday in this case. This jury could decide 50-50, y'all go away. They could decide everybody's partly at fault. You're skiing, 
just go. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, we're all joking aside, I was like, you know how much I fall down every day or I accidentally trip? Like, I mean, before the pandemic, I would trip into people accidentally, you know, like I, I, I would always apologize, but it was like, but is there any chance that Gwyneth will get the death penalty? Can she go away for life on this? Is there, what, what happens if Gwyneth loses and what happens if Gwyneth wins? If Gwyneth wins, she can get attorney's fees. Okay. And $1. And $1. Yeah. Attorney's fees being the big thing. If Gwyneth loses, then she has to pay this plaintiff his whatever damages the jury decides if the jury decides damages. So the jury is trying to decide non-economic damages, which means they're trying to compensate him for pain, suffering, and for having to deal with all the shit after the ski accident. Whether they decide there is much shit after the ski accident is really why we're seeing so many medical experts testifying. And I've had you know, 30 to 50,000 people on stream every day. And most of them are like, why are we talking about his brain so much? When do we find out who collided into who? And I'm like, oh no, they already covered that evidence. And they're like, yeah, I still don't understand. I'm like, right. It does not look good for plaintiff at this point because people are still so unclear on how this collision happened. And parts of the plaintiff's story are simply not believable. It's clear that he wasn't unconscious for five minutes. And if the jury hones in on that, they're going to be like, well, why should I believe any of it? Paltrow's story makes more sense to me. The Paltrow story also has some weird bits in it where she said he bumped into the back of her and then was grunted. Grown. Yeah. She, it, she, she alluded that she was like, it could have been some sort of sexual misconduct or, or, thought or it something was of that. Yeah. Her yeah. brain went there immediately, but also how many people just bump into Gwyneth Paltrow in her life, right? Uh, is Gwyneth Paltrow ever in a situation with us normies where people are just like bumping into her? She was just like so rattled that somebody was touching her on a ski Yes. Couch. And it's quite odd. Like it I speaks to celebrity. Funny. It speaks to the culture of celebrity, yes. how in a bubble, sometimes these people are. And I think that's what's interesting too, is that when Gwyneth takes the stand or something, you really, you know, it's, it, I, I really enjoy it, but I don't think I'm supposed to enjoy it, but it's, it shows a very affected person in some way. She's very calm. And then we have the, uh, the, 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 the You're prosecuting turning. attorneys seem like fangirling over her at time, at times. It's the very interesting to see. Plaintiff's attorney was like, you know, may I ask how tall you are? And Gwyneth Paltrow is like five ten, And she's like, Oh, I'm so Girl. jealous. It's like, are you sitting down with a glass of wine? <laughs> going, oh my God. Gwyneth, <laughs> Can you, you bring out a, a charcuterie head. tray? If Gwyneth could actually eat <laughs> processed meats, it would be great if that was happening. I imagine Gwyneth doesn't eat cheese either. Oh God, no. Right? Yeah. It's just, it felt like it, there were moments that were, I think, trying to be human to the jury, but it was in such an odd way. And we are coming off of, Depp heard was such a large celebrity trial with such A-list celebrities. And we saw the lawyers act completely different in that trial versus the, oh my God, I have to wear four inch heels to be five, five on a good day. And Gwyneth Paltrow being like, well, they're very nice. There were so many odd moments in that testimony. I mean, the and ski outfit where Gwyneth says she's wearing, she's been wearing the same ski really outfit nice. for, yeah, it's like, it's so, it's and so Taylor bizarre. Swift. And yeah, she brought, she, you guys, I tell you back to this on Monday. She had brought up Taylor Swift. Are you friends with Taylor Swift? And she's like, I mean, friendly. And then she's like, well, you sent her a gift on Christmas. And it was like a goop care package that I think a lot of celebrities get. And that's another <laughs> culture of celebrity. Package yeah, PR package. Different than actually sending intimate gifts. And then Gwyneth's attorney is sitting at the table going, why don't you ask her about Oprah? I'm like, we're <laughs> right now. Are we in court? We've got Taylor Swift and Oprah and Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Yeah, ask her about seven too. Was it cool to make that movie? Was it weird to work with her boyfriend at the time? Like, I want to know if we're really doing inside the actor studio. Let's go. I want to know Let's all do it of all. it. Ask all um, the questions. It was so if, strange. It, if the plaintiff does win, though, I mean, it's like, what's to stop then? I feel like I'm going to so, tro like throw myself into Gwyneth and try to get like money from it. Like, I mean, this seems like such a weird case because they both have very different stories, both very yeah. um, solid in what they remember to be happening. The only reason I tend to side with Gwyneth, it's not celebrity. It's just the fact that I don't think she would show up for something if she was like, she was like, no, this is too far. I know exactly what happened. And I'm going to, because otherwise I would believe you would settle of like, yeah, I did do that that day. And I think the jury's going to be asking themselves that too. What does Gwyneth Paltrow stand to gain in being there for two weeks in this courtroom, getting asked questions? What does she have to gain versus what does Terry Sanderson have to gain? He's asking for over $3.2 million. Um, 
So where Whoa. is it here? Yeah. So they're going to be evaluating who has something to gain, but also Sanderson, his daughters testified that he's obsessed with this case. And I think that doesn't go well for him when the jury's like, is this a cash grab because she's a celebrity? His friend was thrilled th to find that it was Gwyneth Paltrow on the mountain that day and then was gossiping about where she was staying and his friends that worked in the local resorts and talking about that. Look, I used to work at Sports Chalet and Marina Del Rey. The second a celebrity was in our store, we all knew when we were talking about yes. it. Costume, when the, you know, the costume department would come in grabbing, you know, 15 pairs of shoes or whatever for a movie. We're like, oh, what are you working on? Who's on it? Yes. You know, when you're in a workplace where celebrities come in, you kind of know who's there. And it sounded like they knew that she was on or around the mountain and was staying there. And that's not unusual at Deer Valley. It's a real bougie place. So, Dude, I mean, I worked, I used to work when I first came here at like a celebrity spa uh, in West Hollywood. And like, even that we were in Hollywood and anytime, like, it's like, Will Ferrell's here today? Like, yeah, what does he look oh, like cool. naked? What does he look like? I mean, like, it would be like, <laughs> he would, I'm telling you, you are very aware and very you aware. do, there is this pressurized era around celebrities that we give them. You've been covering pop culture and the intersection of law and things like that. And not only pop culture, because you do the Murdoch trial, you're going to do the Idaho uh, trial, I would imagine. You've covered all of these really intense things, but the pop culture aspect keeps coming back. Is there something you're noticing? Um, because it, to me, I just don't remember this many celebrity um, court driven cases that are of this magnitude have we crossed over in pop culture and pop fandom where it's not just reality shows and music and tv and movies we love we love court cases with celebrities well we've always loved court cases i mean you look at like casey anthony and the oj simpson case it's what we're seeing now with technology and access to courtrooms is we now have the ability to access any courtroom in America that allows it and bring the audience in. And so you can have these celebrity civil cases be televised. And that is a newer phenomenon. Celebrities didn't used to expose themselves in this way, but our society has changed. And so when you look at something like Depp v. Heard or Cardi B versus Tasha K, you've got these celebrity driven defamation cases because defamation depending on what's being spread can be tremendously impactful to a career. So now we're starting to see more civil cases actually go to trial. And then you've got these reality stars and we've seen this back since the first guy on survivor, Richard Hatch had a tax case. And then you see it with yeah. sure with tax cases. And then you see it with the Chrisleys and these cases. So it's not that we haven't had them. It's that the access is a bit better now than it has been. And then you get them streaming all over the internet with people like myself. I've been a lawyer for 17 years. I was an in-court lawyer for over 10. So I've done my own trials. So I get to bring a different perspective to it. Yeah. I've from my house via YouTube, that kind of access has never happened before. And then I also get to go and give commentary on, on court TV and others because they ask, but I get to go directly to the audience and have a conversation in real time about what's happening in court. And that is new just because of technology. It's instantaneous and it's fascinating. You can't make up what's gonna happen in court. Court is wild. The amount of time that my jaw drops in, in the Murdoch case, the defense attorney, who's also a state senator, took an assault weapon, turned around and pointed it at the prosecutor's table, laughed to himself and went, tempting. I was like, what is, what is happening in court? The good old boys, the good old boys, yes. yeah. You can't make up court. <laughs> I know this about court. I have been in that circumstance where stuff has happened in court. And as the lawyer, you're sitting there looking around going, did anyone see this with me? Now I get to do that with hundreds of thousands of people. <laughs> well, I mean, it really, I mean, and you worked in the field. So to you, when you're, you're seeing this access, you know, that something you possibly couldn't imagine 17 or 18 years ago when you were actually knee deep in this, does yeah. it, I mean, it's got to blow your mind, the technology that you're being able to do and reach the audience you're reaching. But even as a lawyer that worked in the field, is this a good or a bad thing if you were still a lawyer and not doing what you do now? I think it's mixed. I think it's a, it's a thing that has to be acknowledged and navigated. And I've talked to different bar associations about this. When I, when I talked to lawyers about acknowledging technology, we saw that come up in the Gwyneth Paltrow case that there's this meetup link from 2016. Yes. That the lawyers could access. And the internet had that link in 30 seconds from it being posted on the screen. Everybody's like, oh, you just need a meetup account, click the link and, or type the link directly into the browser and everybody found it. So lawyers have to be aware of the internet 
playing into their cases. They have to be aware of Reddit, not just Twitter. They have to be aware of where people are dissecting their cases, but also aware that you can find witnesses that way. In Depp v. Heard, we had Morgan Knight and Morgan Tremaine both testify because they saw the trial televised and they went, wait, no, I was there for that. That's not how it went down. And then they contacted the legal team saying, I'm a witness to this. That's not how it went down. So you have witnesses actually being brought to court because they saw it on stream and they saw the trial and knew that they were a Jeez. witness, even though the lawyers didn't identify them. It makes it more dynamic. You have a lot more input into your trial, but then you also have a downside where you have people inserting themselves into trial. In the Daryl Brooks case, we saw somebody pretending to be a juror on Reddit, and that had to be investigated by the court. We've seen threats called in to stop court for the day. So now courts are essentially getting swatted while they are being live streamed. We've seen that in two trials that I've covered now. So there is a dynamic component to it. I think access to courts is always good. I think visibility and transparency in our courts is always good. I worry that when the internet internets, it makes the judges hesitant because you've also heard witnesses from the Depp case on both sides, witnesses for the defense and for the plaintiff say that they've been harassed off the internet because they were witnesses in this case. And that can impact having good witnesses in a case and people who saw something not wanting to come forward because it's going to be televised. And I think that is a problem. And we're seeing the Idaho college yeah. grapple with that. And we're seeing it in an appeal now over the, over the non-dissemination order and how open can courts be. And then we're also seeing that TikToker defamation suit going on with the Idaho case based on what somebody said about. Yeah. Well, was it the, you know, uh, well, uh, I want to bring up one point is that just uh, to bring it back to the Sheena Shea stuff today, uh, TMZ had requested a live stream of those hearings and it was not granted. LA so says no. LA says no, but LA then to move the Idaho uh, case, which has been, uh, you know, my audience knows I've been really fascinated with it and I don't really cover it because that's not my thing, but I have been like a lot of people consuming everything. I don't believe the trial would start until the end of June. Is that correct? The preliminary hearing is starting in June um, and I'll be covering that too. The preliminary hearing starts in June. It should be under two weeks. Uh, I think they've set aside seven days, six, seven days for it. So that's not a trial. That is before you get to a trial. So no jury, the judge makes a determination there. And do, are they just presenting evidence and, yes, and evidence and witnesses? They don't, there's some different rules for prelims. So if there's a witness statement, they don't necessarily have to present the witness. They can present law enforcement who says, I spoke to the witness and they said this. So some slightly different rules in a trial, but it's going to be our first time of really seeing the evidence that they have to hold Brian Koberger to answer for these murders. They need to show enough evidence to prove that this is likely the person who did this, not beyond a reasonable doubt. So the standards are different, no jury, but we're going to get a good look at this evidence and these lawyers. Will we get a good look at what the defense has to prove that he is not uh, most likely to have done this? The defense can present a defense. Often the defense will not do so because okay. they don't want to tip their hand. So they will normally do a vigorous cross-examination and not present defense evidence because the standard is so low, it doesn't benefit them oftentimes um, unless they're presenting something like a self-defense claim, which doesn't seem to be the issue here. So it would be unusual for them to present a defense. It would not be unusual for them to vigorously cross-examine the prosecution's witnesses. Now, Brian Koberger, for me, I mean, I like I said, I like, you know, I was just screaming things into my phone so I would get the TikToks of Brian Koberger case. And uh to me, I'm like, well, we got him. Well, this is him. Like, I'm like, I'm I'm in. Let's do this. Let's, I mean, and and they want to present a very strong case. And I, you know, this is when you realize how delicate the legal system is. And I mean, what what is going through a defense attorney's mind representing Brian Koberger when if you do look at all of these facts, it seems overwhelming, even though I guess you can like it's is it considered like a game for the defense of like, oh, I can take this cell phone tower uh, stuff away because I can say he did this. I can take him putting his phone on airplane mode during the murders. I can say it's because of this. Like what what is going through a defense attorney's mind? Is it do they even question like do they like, well, I know he did it, but we're going to try to get him off. What what goes through a, a defense attorney's mind, you think? So I've never worked defense, so I'm going to couch it with that. I have lots of friends who yeah. are defense attorneys. I've had lots of conversations with defense attorneys. It depends on the attorney. This is the same with prosecutors. 
But a lot of the times what the defense is looking for first is, is the state overreaching? Did they get it right? Did they get it wrong? Are these warrants appropriate? Are the assumptions they're making appropriate? Are the defendant's rights being um, being violated in some way or not? Is this a rush to judgment? Is this the right person? Is that really his car? Is the car on video actually the car that he was driving or is it another car like it? They are questioning everything. Um, and of course they are keeping a mind of, okay, well, if he did it, how, what evidence shows that if he didn't do it, if, if they believe he didn't do it, that becomes a very high stakes game. Cause this is a state with a death penalty that he could very real, real, um, be prosecuted and receive the death penalty for a quadruple homicide like this. So then that becomes a very, very high stakes scenario where you're literally fighting for someone's life, not just their freedom. So the defense is looking to make sure the state's doing their job and the defense is looking to make sure that they are poking all the holes that they need to, whether or not they think the client is guilty. For most defense attorneys, I know that's the farthest thought from their mind. It's really looking at what the prosecution is doing yeah. first. I mean, he was a criminology student for the love of, I mean, like I, I just, so many things seem to just be like, well, that's a really crappy coincidence if he did not do these crimes, but this is what court trials are all about. And this is, and so you will be covering this every day on your YouTube. Like, will you just yes. be, I mean, cause that's going to be intense. Like, so when you cover something like this, how do you prepare for it? And like, what is the, I mean, are you there? Like how long, how many hours a day are you streaming with this stuff? Because you have such a large audience. You're, you're almost like you're, I mean, you're going to hit a million YouTube subscribers by the end of the year, I would imagine. How do you handle this large of an audience? How do you prepare? And what, what is that like? It's, it can be a lot of people. I mean, our, my stream max concurrent viewers during depth v heard topped out over 370,000 live concurrent viewers at that point it's just like holding on to the audience and just being like okay we're here i can't read all of the chat we're going to do the best that we can because it's just so many people but when we're talking about a case like Koberger, I'm very mindful of the cases that I choose to cover. Once I choose to cover them, I know that I'm kind of in it. I get very fascinated by things. And if I'm in it, I'm in it. So I need to make sure that it's a case that's not tremendously emotionally draining. The um, the Brooks case out of, out. oh God, I'm going to forget the location of the Brooks case because my brain is just stuck. <laughs> but the Brooks case was very difficult to cover. It was a very emotional case. A lot of people lost their lives. There was a lot of damage done. So going into a case like that, I know it's going to be very draining. And I try to convey with my audience how I do that, how I kind of re-regulate after emotional trials and knowing that I'm picking trials where I can help. So where I can help explain the process, where I can help remind people of the rights of the defendant, what the what the prosecution has to prove, and kind of shed some light on it and really watch the process play out and explain it. But it does take a lot of prep work to yeah. know what's going on in a case. But I cover these cases sometimes for a lot of time running up to them. Sometimes I come in fresh like the jury and say, I know nothing about this case. Convince me. Tell me what you're doing. Tell me what your case is. Prove your evidence to me. And I'm not looking at rumors and, and Reddit and other things on the internet, though. I love those conversations. I try to stay out of them in the case yeah. until after. I was thinking about that too, is that I was talking about this the other day and this is goes not with what you're doing, but more like, I don't get to go on, like I've never been a Reddit person and I don't really, like Facebook, I'll go on and wish happy birthdays. And I have a Facebook group that a lot of people, you know, are cool in, but I don't, you know, I used to, before a podcast and before I talked about this every day, I used to be making snarky comments on Facebook groups and I used to really be in all of these things. And I have to remove myself from a lot of that because I'm kind of like the only thing I have is my own opinion. Like, you know, you actually have the facts and all that. That stuff and where your heart leads you and your personal stamp on this but it's kind of like even with this like i have to kind of drown out everybody else's voice so i can actually keep my voice and my voice is sometimes completely wrong but it's still my voice <laughs> yes it, it takes some focusing and some tuning out and i always if i've covered a case like the murdoch case i started covering before he was charged with the murders of his wife and son so i came into that with a lot of background because i was covering the south carolina girardi right this is the south yeah. carolina equivalent well and then you even, did you were you already time. then the stephen smith stuff you you, you know yes. which by the way they are now uh opening are they opening that case up again because i know they exhumed the body they are uh they, they've determined it is a murder correct and will this go to trial i mean can they do they have anything to go to trial with bus with bus bus 
<laughs> so with the Stephen Smith case, I actually, my podcast that came out today is on this case. So they opened the investigation. SLED has explained, and SLED is the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. They've explained that they were never asked to investigate this initially in 2015 when he was found dead on the side of the road because the coroner determined it was a hit and run. I've looked through the coroner's report. I've looked through the initial investigate investigative record. I've also dealt with a lot of vehicle collision and vehicular homicide cases. This is not a hit and run. I agree with all of the law enforcement that said in their initial reports, this is not a hit and run. Why the coroner ruled it a hit and run is highly suspicious to me. And I have a lot of questions. So SLED has now taken on the investigation. They said that they did that in 2021 because of evidence that came up investigating Maggie and Paul's death. I want to know what that is so badly. And we don't know yet. Now we know that other lawyers have come in to work with uh, Stephen Smith's mother, Sandy Smith, and pay to have an independent autopsy, which requires his body to be exhumed. So to be take unburied and then sent for an independent autopsy. I don't know if they need an independent autopsy because the coroner's report gave quite a lot of information. The conclusion just seems very, very odd but this is what they're choosing to do. SLED is still investigating. I imagine this is gonna be a highly digital investigation. Who was he talking to? What was he doing? Figuring out what his life looked like in the weeks leading up to this, to this homicide. It has now been ruled a homicide investigation. So the coroner had originally said the cause of death was undetermined. Well, if there's a hit and run, somebody's driving a vehicle, how is the cause of death undetermined? Homicide for a coroner means at the hands of another. A hit and run is technically a homicide at the hands of another. So there's a lot of oddness here. Will we ever see a trial? We need a suspect first. Are there suspects? Maybe, but we don't know who they are. Is that suspect Buster Murdoch? We don't know, but we know that he put out a very strong statement saying, yes. I have nothing to do with this. Please stop. Well, I mean, and uh, this is where, I mean, and courts actually come in handy, I guess, because, you know, a normal person would be like, okay, well, we see his father, the abuse of the system, you know, he's, you know, many times had law enforcement look the other way. He wore a badge on that first night of the boat accident going into the hospital, you know, like we see all of this stuff. So I'm like, well, listen, there's been manipulation in the past. Why would there not be mani manipulation here as well? But you're not allowed to do that, right? Like you, can you present those facts as part of a case? There, it would be very unusual and very yeah. unlikely. You would have to have direct evidence that that's what was going on. It has to be beyond mere speculation. You would need like evidentiary support. <laughs> <That's how laughs> so you can't just go on mere speculation. And that's what's hard because if you're Buster Murdaugh and you had nothing to do with this, assuming that that is the case, if you had nothing to do with this, imagine how damaging to reputation and to your own mental health it would be for everybody to say, no, you murdered this kid. It would yeah. be tremendously damaging. So, and if you think that he did do it, imagine the weight of all of those jail conversations with his dad, knowing that maybe law enforcement is coming for you and that the dynasty is toppling. And that's something SLED said at the end, is they're optimistic that people are going to be more willing to talk now than they were in 2015 and 2021. And that is directly because Alec Murdaugh is now in jail. So SLED thinks there's something here. Yeah. And I think there, there, there are a lot of questions remaining. And I would start my questions with the coroner's report and the digital evidence. That's where I would start. I would not start with the rumors about Buster Murdaugh. You have to keep them in mind. I would start with the digital evidence first and work from there. Did they, in your opinion, after covering the trial, did this jury, did they get it right with, uh, with Mr. I still Murdoch? have questions. I think this jury had absolutely enough evidence to convict him. Uh, there's going to be an appeal on that. Whether some evidence was let in that shouldn't have been let in is going to be the heart of that appeal. Alec Murdaugh is asking for more money to do this appeal, and there's going to be objections to that. But did this jury have enough to base this on? Yes. Do I know for 100% certain in my heart of heart how he did this, what he did, did he do this? I still have questions about this case, man. It's odd. There's some odd things in this case. Now, it was always up for debate, uh, should he take the stand or not? And he took the stand. And listen, I, you know, my dad always told, I made him watch an episode of Vanderpump Rules and he'd said about <laughs> Jax Taylor. And he said, the show needs a villain. Jax Taylor is a good villain. And now Tom Sandoval is a good villain, potentially. But, you know, this Murdoch guy, like, I, I hate, this is when it becomes pop culture in a way where I was like, he's magnetic. This guy's killing, like, you know, it's it's ridiculous. 
but you can't keep your, cause it's so there's a performative element to it. You know, there's this there really, is. you know, he's snotting. He's like, before he's calling everybody nicknames like MM. Hey, MM, M M M D yeah. Baker. What's going on? Like it's this old oh, shucks kind of backwoods. And it was, but at the same time, I was fixated on his testimony. Court drama is human drama and it's not much different than reality TV. The stakes are way higher but it's human drama playing out. Like the lives of the Murdaws are a soap opera wrapped in an actual real life family and an enigma and a riddle and cash. Like it's, it's wild to watch. And it is a peek into somewhere where a lot of us don't live. It is a peek into another way of life. It is, everybody's got a nickname. Everyone's got a gun in the back of their truck. People are just going to parties and things are getting stolen. Everybody's like, ah, this is the way it is. It's all fine. You know, they're dropping the truck off at, at you know, Bo, whoever, the, the yeah. guns are named. Everything's got a nickname. Yeah. Riveting. But this, the defendant, Alec Murdoch, clearly has a very persuasive personality. And we've seen that in you know a a Tom Girardi as well and we we see that in even Jen Shaw well, these very trend. persuasive personalities very engaging they pull you in they're dynamic they're charismatic they they could be politicians if they wanted to be um and found other ways to make money but at the end of the day i think Alec Murdoch testifying is why he was convicted I don't know oh. if they would have convicted him if he had not tested. Really? Okay, so that went against him potentially in that case. That's that's absolutely, really absolutely went against him. Okay. Now are, moving there on. There are things I will I will be speculative on and things I will be very strong <laughs> on. When I watched I'm... his testimony, I was like, "Oh, you you're probably done." Yep. <laughs> but I mean, but, but we'll we'll have that forever. Like I was like, "Oh my god!" I, if I was auditioning for Yale Drama School, I would probably use this in my contemporary monologue. It was like really kind of. I was like, "Wow, he's really going for it." Like you Wait know, if it. you were doing this for TV or film, they'd be like, "Bring it down. We want to make it more real. Too just big. bring it down. Too big. Let's just the audience can feel it." Um, moving on to uh, Rust, the Alec Baldwin saga of uh, the fatal death of Hala Hutchins, the cinematographer. It seems like there's been a lot of we uh, a movement on this. Uh, where do we stand with this? Because I just read, didn't the DA remove themselves from the case? So weird. We are getting ready for preliminary hearing with Rust. That's going to be a two week televised hearing in May that I will be covering. Oh, I'm God. very annoyed at the scheduling of it because it's going to conflict with birthday plans, but it's fine. <laughs> We're in it. We're in it. Wait, it be great if you're at a birthday party streaming, uh, you know. <laughs> about Alec Baldwin. Darn you, Baldwin. So the rust is going to be a two week, which seems way too long preliminary hearing. There's been a lot of movement in it. Baldwin's attorneys have been very active in pushing this case. They are not allowing the preliminary hearing to go forward outside of the time. So they are like, no, you charged him. We're going to preliminary hearing. The special prosecutor that was appointed is also a legislature, and there was a conflict there, says Baldwin's attorneys. I think they had a very interesting argument, and the the um, the special prosecutor ended up stepping aside after that argument was made and saying, we don't want to distract anymore. I'm like, but you should have known this at the beginning. And then an email was released where the special prosecutor is like, this might be good for my re-election campaign. And I was like, what are you doing? This is just... Everybody's no, idiots in this world. It's Everybody's just idiots. Wild to see. So the special prosecutor stepped aside. We will see what happens. The prosecutors have made some errors in this case that don't bode well um, for this case. They charged the wrong sections at the beginning of the thing and had to remove the gun enhancement that they charged. Some errors that I was very surprised to see from the elected district attorney, the head boss of this area. Um, it's it was interesting to see will this will this i mean you know, he he loves to speak will we get alex baldwin uh alec baldwin taking the stand on this will he be able to speak his piece on the stand they can present a defense at preliminary hearing i don't know why they would but if there's a case where it's likely i would say this case is where it's likely but baldwin i think talked himself into a prosecution with his police interviews and with the George Stephanopoulos interviews, those are going to come up and be used against him uh, to great effect. I think it's part of the reason they were able to charge this. They charged it because he went on and on about what an expert he was with guns. And he did that in multiple interviews. If I'm his attorneys, I am still trying to get him to shut up and say less. So I don't think they'll let him testify. He might very much want to. Yeah, people's own vanity seems to get the best of them, especially in court. Um, I, I always find that 
really, really interesting. Um, as we start winding down here, I wanted Wait, to go can, back. Can I interrupt yeah. you, Ryan? Before you always. Down? Yes. You sent me down a rabbit hole and I have to tell you something. Yes. So I went to go look about Jen Shaw's lawyer's motion to withdraw and I saw it and can verify it. But the prosecution filed a new motion this morning that I have, I don't know if it's even been reported yet because it just popped up on Pacer. Breaking news, breaking, breaking news. news. Breaking news, thank you for asking. So this <laughs> is from the government. It is a substitution of assets for her um, restitution. So she was supposed to forfeit over $6.5 million in restitution. They haven't been able to find all that money, but they found a few assets. And I think you might be really interested in what these assets are that they found. Yes, please lay them on me. One Branoff six uh, silver colored necklace with snowflake shaped pendant containing <laughs> six diamonds. Aren't those the ones she was buying on the show? Yeah, 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 necklaces. yeah. Yes. So they found the snowflake necklace with six diamonds from the shop, <laughs> and they are now seeking to forfeit it. One lady's 18 karat rose gold diamond ring, size eight and three fourths, weighing 5.6 um, DWT total weight. So those right. are two things that they are trying to forfeit now. But we now have the um, the snowflake necklace being forfeited to the U.S. government from Jen Shaw, which I think I'm so, is hilarious. Well, that, that's where I wanted to come back to just because I, I didn't get to talk to you at the time of the Jen Shaw uh, sentencing. Um, and I find this all interesting because she was ordered to pay $6.2 million restitution or she had agreed to, which yep. meant that she, didn't that mean part of it she already had to give to, had to, give to yeah, them? Like they would she had this, have some of it. Yeah, but you're saying like, didn't she agree to that? Then she has to pay $9 million on top of that or something wild? I would have to go back and pull up the document yeah. for exact. Well, it numbers, was something wild where they can garnish her wages, fifteen yes, percent of believe. money, and then an amount of property that they were seeking to grab, and some of the property and money they'd already taken, they'd already forfeited bank accounts and things like that. It's a it's a large sum of money, but some of it is joint with other defendants. So if other defendants pay it, she oh, pays. so there are some there are some quirks to that, but yes, it's her restitution is very substantial. There's well, no so understanding how substantial it is. She was sentenced like seven and a half, but I believe as of yesterday, it went down to five and a half years. She's going to have to serve. Well, she was never going to serve day for day, a hundred percent of her time. So that's not surprising. And there are of course things she can do when she's in custody that like drug program her to have less time. Um, yeah. uh, I've been reading some of her prison journals that keeps popping up on her Instagram yeah. and it's very, uh, I really don't think that's the way to go um, in, in just personal opinion. And I know you, you know, deal in facts and law and things like that, but it, it's very interesting that I still don't think she gets it. Do you remember though, in terms of the sentencing, did you think that was a fair sentence? Were you shocked it was as little or did you think it was going to be even smaller? I was, I thought it was like, oh, I was expecting nine. I thought, and I was like, wow, does, cause I thought even her statement, the lawyer statement was so, um, uh, flowery and just kind of, uh, and we saw all these examples of her not taking it seriously. So I didn't understand the judges. Uh, I don't know. It, it confused me in a way. Did it make sense completely to you? I understand why the judge did it for all the government arguing that she was one of the most culpable defendants. I thought it was a little bit long, but it is her first offense that's going to play heavily into this. And she was sentenced to a substantial amount of restitution and that's going to play into it. Um, sentencing for fraud crimes and other types of white collar crimes does tend to be a bit lower, but after the Chrisleys got sentenced so high, I was surprised to see yeah. her sentencing a bit lower. And we also saw, um, Elizabeth Holmes get a bit of a higher sentence though. She did put people in danger in a different way, but it was still a fraud case. So it's interesting to see different judges in different jurisdictions. But when you look at the co-defendants, this is in line. I thought it would be a bit higher than some of the co-defendants and it wasn't. So that surprised me, but it was still within the range of what I was thinking. It wasn't so low that I was shocked. It was like, okay, that's the lower end of what I thought would be, would be the sentence here. And Elizabeth Holmes is actually going to the same prison eventually that Jen yes. Shaw's in. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, I was checking out this prison and I was like, they don't even have like locks on the doors. They're like four to a room. It's I mean, a it's low. It's a minimum security prison. I like it. Camp. So it is. It seems very like she and she said on her diary, she said, like my first day I was handed a bag with an apple, a piece of wheat bread, oatmeal, instant coffee. And then she was like, 
And it, you know, it is something about made me sad. I was like, made me sad. I didn't even have breakfast. Are you kidding me? That's like, <laughs> that's a, a whole piece of bread. It's so great. She's teaching, she's teaching exercise classes. Um, <laughs> Somebody and- said that her hair looks great. I was like, I don't care what her hair looks like. Are you kidding me? It's really interesting to keep trying to keep a hold of the public, uh, uh, the public desire to see you. Like you seem like she wants to stay in that kind of limelight in some way, I feel. I think she almost has to, because what is she going to do after this to pay off all this restitution that's going to be coming away from her family? Um, what is she going to do if she comes out? If she comes out in five plus years and everyone has moved on, what does Jen Shaw do next? She needs to get a send it to Daryl shirt like Lala did she does for need the to send uh, it to shirt. Send it, yeah. Shit. I want to send it to Emily shirt. I need to make. By the way, that's Darryl. see, that's a shirt I would buy. Send it to Daryl. And by the way, I was like, well, we, Ryan, can we make matching shirts? Can we make yeah. like with all of our names? Like, send it to Emily. Send that's it to it. Ryan. Can we just send it to? Kiki? Can we all get our well, own send it shirts? Lala, Lala went on her podcast today and said those shirts helped pay for the down payment on her Palm Springs home. I was like, oh my oh, God, what my a God. way to, I was like, this is just, what a truly weird world we live in. Um, uh, but finally though, I I was just thinking about this, uh, two kind of things is that like, is there ever been anybody that's approached you yet? Or like, hey, I want you to represent me. I want you to get out from my, I, I need you, Emily. I need you back. I need you on my case. Like, is it, I just feel at this point, you've gotten to some kind of, notoriety and you're so good at what you do has anybody tried to be like get out from behind that computer and come to court i need your help yeah people want me to leave my house all the time and i say <laughs> all the time <laughs> i want to stay at my house in my fuzzy slippers no, people want to but do people want them to represent like to, like have you represent them i am in my fuzzy slippers look i have had law firms offer me jobs i have had lawyers try to hire me i have had clients try to hire me and i am always very happy to say these are lawyers in this area that I know if I know them, or this is how I find a good attorney. I do not take on clients like that. I do some consulting work that you will never hear about because I don't talk about the consulting work that I do. Um, and I will never case it, cover cases I've consulted on, but I want to stay at my house and be a content creator. I love it the most. I realize that I'm really just a repressed radio DJ. I always loved oh broadcast. Yeah. It's why I started my podcast and then took it to YouTube. I love what I do so much and I get to talk to so many people and help right? them understand law. I don't want to go back to what I was doing. I have tremendous empathy for people who are like, I want you to represent me. I'm like, that's fantastic, but you don't because I don't want to be doing it. <laughs> so. Okay, well, I was just trying to get somebody to, to represent me on my fraud trial. That's probably going to come up pretty soon. Uh, but well, Ryan, okay, let me know and I will send you some recommendations. I know, <laughs> but I love covering, I, I, <laughs> I feel surprised that this gets to be my job and I know I want to talk about what I want to talk about and all the nerdy weird stuff. It's a dream, right? It's a dream. It yeah. absolutely is a dream. I'm almost 45. I get to live literally my best talking about stuff that I'm entertained by watching these wild trials, having an incredible community of law nerds that we get to joke with and have a lot of fun with. And I get to do this every single day. I That's, get to turn and, on the and, microphone and talk. It's great. When I do read, con- like when, I, when I'm on Instagram, people are like, oh, I learned this from Emily D. Baker. Or I learned this from like, and I think that is the cool, like you walk three, really people through the law. I walk people through fart jokes every day. And I'm so proud of that. Don't, and it, don't. Don't you dare undersell. A no, no, no. I was, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm just saying, <laughs> don't you dare I'm just saying it's so I cool. love a good fart joke and you're um, on point. Okay. And then the, the final thing is, is would you recommend in this uh, climate, if there is a down on their luck star, is the way to get back on top uh, a trial? Like, I mean, like uh, into kind of a dark comedy, wag the dog, Dr. Strangelove way. I feel like these trials really give people heat where sometimes they need it. They are all of a sudden back. Like Gwyneth Paltrow, she was coming off that weird interview podcast about eating, you know, drinking bone broth three times a day. And now we see her on the trial and we're like, Oh, Gwyneth, I love her. What a weird, what a fun weird person. You remember yeah, when I was she like, was God, I got to go see talented Mr. Ripley again. Like I was like, you know, is, is, Shakespeare in love. <laughs> yeah, do you, I mean, do you ever think that this could possibly in the near future be something that people actually use uh, in a different way than actually for the intents and purposes of the law? I have been saying that law and lawsuits are a PR strategy for a while now. And we have seen that in a few prominent cases, one being that Nike Satan shoes case. 
the art collective. Oh, I remember that. Those Satan shoes and little Nas X kind of posed with them and Nike lost their mind, but the headlines were like Nike Satan shoes and Nike's like, stop it, it's not us. So they filed a lawsuit about it and it actually helped redirect the PR narrative in the media. PR and law for high profile companies and individuals are going hand in hand. And we're seeing more and more creators get dragged into them with stuff like the crypto FTX. We're seeing the FTC go after Kim Kardashian for improperly promoting things. We are going to see more and more of where pop culture and the law blends. And I have never been more thankful. Thank you. I am here for it. You are going to be <laughs> well employed. I get to talk to people like yourself that I just really enjoy because we're nerds about the same stuff and it's so fun. I get to be my own awkward self. Yeah on the internet. And then occasionally I get to be on TV too, all across the world. Like the fact that I was on like, you know, good you're morning. on ABC all I've the been, time. Every, I, it's been everywhere. I, see I was on good morning Britain and it blew like, can, my mind. Can you, that, that's what I'm like. What I, I just, that, I mean, I was, I was in the Washington post the other day, took me out to inter, and I was just like, because of the scandal ball stuff. And I was like, this is insane. This that's, is, if I could tell that little kid that I would someday be in a Washington Post article for something right. that doesn't involve crime, I'd be like, so <laughs> sorry. You know what I'm saying? Like, and by the way, it's yeah. like a horrible thing because it involves people cheating or involves these kind of horrific cases for you. But at the same time, I geek out on this stuff majorly. Like, I, I'm like, what a treat. And it is a huge treat to talk to you again today, Emily. And you really, uh, you entertain all of us, but you really inspire me on so many different levels that aside from the law, and I know you know, and you do that for all of us content creators. So thank you for that. Your uh, YouTube channel, uh, it's Emily D. Baker. You're going to find everything there, but your podcast too, it's the Emily Show podcast. And she does have a whole episode. I'm looking at it now on the Stephen Smith death investigation. She had a whole episode seven days ago on the Gwyneth Paltrow ski, ski, ski crash two weeks ago, the Idaho college murders. So that podcast <laughs> seems to be a dope one. And what you can do is you can make these little playlists. So you can just go bam, 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 like watching your favorite show, which I know uh, your show is a lot of people's favorite show. So Emily D. Baker is there anything else going on that we need to know about? Well, we've got Rust coming up. We've got the Idaho case coming up. I am covering all the influencers getting sued over crypto stuff on the influencer and celebrity side because I'm fascinated. Is Larry David a part of that, I heard? Uh, like I heard he was like so Matt Damon many. and it's Larry every, David. It's literally yeah. everybody you can name. Um, there are a few other cases that I'm peeking in on, but I didn't expect Paltrow to take up as much time. We've got the Brittany Dawn law uh, trial. Oh yes, in May. Yes, big ups I, to God. When we do when we do pop culture and influencers, it's fascinating to see them play into court. We've all you know we've got more YouTubers being sued over crypto stuff. So I. That's it. But the next live trials are going to be really rust and then Idaho. And then we'll go from there. Emily show for you like Chelsea Handler, your are your, it's Emily lately. You, uh, you, uh, you're the head. And then you have three pop culture critics aside from you that, that like how she used to do on Chelsea lately talking about these things and you're the Chelsea figure. And then, uh, yeah, anyway, we we'll, need we'll a talk about that. Round table. Here's the thing. We need BravoCon to do a couple creator panels where, you can have a conversation with creators commenting on everything that's going on, or even like a, a evening wrap up. Like here's everything that happened at Bravo yes. the creators that are going to all the panels because the creators drove the interest in BravoCon this year, creating content across TikTok and Instagram. And I was keeping up on what was going on by watching your content on it. The creators at BravoCon worked their asses off. I would love to see a, a media room for the creators so we could all charge our phones, but B, um, some kind of a panel, at least a little bit to let the creators distill everything they've saw and heard and have really a conversation. Yeah. About that's, that's genius. Sure. Cause I also think Bravo is kind of dropping the ball on including not just the creators, but also they're losing it because there's a show behind the show nowadays. And that's the social media show. And they need a weekly wrap up on everything happening with their stars on social media. Cause sometimes that'll be included in the show and half the audience doesn't know what they're talking about. So they, they I feel like it's a real missed opportunity because eventually this re, the, the social media show surpasses the actual reality show in terms of people people's interest. And that's where I tune in to creators like yourself and YouTubers and podcasts, because I don't have time to follow everyone on Twitter. I don't need to be on social that much because I've got my head down doing my own thing. So I follow the creators I trust. And they're like, and they said this on Twitter. <laughs> and, here, and I'm like, no way. And that's uh, But yes, I think Bravo should embrace that and bring some of it into the fold because 
the show doesn't just happen on the show like it used to. The show now happens across social media in real time and sometimes across court in real time. Like with Jen Shaw, camera's up, Jen gets arrested. It's all wild and we see it in real time. Well, Emily D. Baker, thank you for your service. And I hope I uh, I hope I get to talk to you again in the next couple of years. Of uh, but I know oh, right. I will see you before then. <laughs> I know I'm hard to I, schedule. Listen, how, no, it doesn't <laughs> matter. You're, I mean, God, it's like, no, that's why when it comes up, I, I was talking to Sandra. I was like, is it Emily Day yet? Is Like last week, I was like, is it Emily Day yet? I was very excited for this. So thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. And uh, just uh, congratulations. So you, you deserve it. Okay.